Good morning and welcome. I'm Pastor Robin. I am pastor at Eastgate Bible Fellowship. I'm glad that you could join us this morning. We have some special things planned for you as we are going to have a time of worship led by Ava and Alistair Collins. And then our scripture passage for the day is going to be read by Lucas and Sabra Counts. And so I would just like to take a moment now and just open our time in a word of prayer, praying for God's blessing upon, upon our time uh, together this morning. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for this day that you have made and thankful for even this opportunity for us to virtually come together and to be reminded of your grace and of your goodness, to sing of your praises and to hear from your word. God, we just pray for your hand of blessing upon our time this morning. Pray that you would be honored and glorified. We pray that in the midst of this season where we are not able to come together as a church body, uh, we just pray that you would remind us of the solidarity, the unity that we have together because of you, Jesus. And we just pray uh, that as we, as we sing these songs, as we hear them being sung, as we hear the, the teaching and preaching of your word, Lord, that you would be honored and glorified in all of these things. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Hello. Um, we have a few songs that we'd like to share with you guys, and the first song we've got is How Deep the Father's Love for Us. Should I 
came from his reward. I cannot give an answer, but this I know with all my heart. His wounds have paid my ransom. Next, we will be singing When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. And the last song that we'll be sharing with you guys is Great Is Thy Faithfulness. I think this is a really amazing song to be keeping in mind in these uncertain times. Um, God is faithful in every season, and that is something that we can hold on to and we can put our trust in. Thou 
changes not thy compassions, they fail not. As thou hast been, thou forever wilt be. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness, morning by morning new mercies I see. All I have needed thy hand hath provided. Great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. Time and harvest, sun, moon, and stars in their courses above, joined with all nature in manifold witness to thy great faithfulness, mercy. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness, morning by morning new mercies I see. All I have needed thy hand hath provided, great is thy faithfulness. Lord, unto me, pardon for sin and a peace that endureth, thine own dear presence to cheer and to guide, strength for today and bright hope for tomorrow. Blessings all mine with ten thousand beside. Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness. Morning by morning new mercies I see. All I Great is thy faithfulness, great is thy faithfulness, Lord, unto me. I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. For by the grace given to me, I say everyone among you not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. For as in one body we have many members... And the members do not all have the same function. So we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members one of another. Having gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who ex exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in generosity, the one who leads with zeal, the one who does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. Let love be genuine, abhor what is evil, hold fast to what is good. Love one another with brotherly affection, outdo one another in showing honor. Well, thank you so much, Ava and Al, Lucas and Sabra for 
just blessing us this morning with your gifts and talents and, and just helping us this morning. Um, we, I invite you, if you haven't already, to open up your Bibles in Romans chapter 12. We're going to be continuing the series that we're going through titled Flashback. And the whole premise of this is, you know, after coming through the Easter season, we want to, we want our lives to reflect the sacrifice that Jesus Christ gave for us, the life that he lived, the sacrifices that he made. We want all of his life to be reflected in our life, and, and that will be accomplished as we look back to his life, as we look back to the cross. And so as we, last week we, we started this series looking at verses 1 and 2 of chapter 12, and we see how Paul just lays down for us very, in very practical terms that there is a mindset, there is a battle of world views going on in our hearts and our minds, and we need to submit ourselves to the worldview of Scripture and of God and not of this world. And so as we, as we look, we, we see that as Paul uh, begins this chapter, uh, the first thing that he's going to get to right at the heart, uh, he gets right to the heart. And he, he nails down for you and for me that uh, all of this Christian life begins with humility and love. And, uh, you know, what we see as we flash back to the life and the sacrifice of Jesus is that Jesus placed a very high priority on humble service and love. As we go back to Easter week and we think about uh, the, the upper room, uh, the whole discourse that takes place in John chapters 13 through 17, we find Jesus in that setting. Uh, he's speaking to his disciples, and it, it's in, this, in the context of this meal that, that uh, he initiates the new covenant, and he is found washing the feet of the disciples, and he is encouraging them with many words, uh, he, he says a lot through that whole discourse, but found in that we find in John 15, verses 12 and 13, he says, this is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. Now just consider the, the, the context that Jesus is speaking these words. In John chapter 13, it is Jesus who is the one who he takes off his outer garments and he kneels down and he is washing the feet of the disciples. Now, I just want you to imagine for a moment, if you were to walk into that room on that evening and you were to just take in the scene, and you see someone who is kneeling on the ground, they've got a towel wrapped around their waist, and, and they are the ones uh, washing the feet of those who are reclined at the table. Who are you going to think is the leader? Who is the one in that scene that's in charge? My guess is, is that we would not think it is the person who is kneeling. It, it would not have been the person washing the feet. That was, a, that was a lowly position. And Jesus, through this whole uh, ordeal, he is, he is again displaying all that he has done from being God. He didn't think being God the thing to be grasped, but he humbled himself and became a human. And here he is leading these disciples that he has, and he is taking on his gar taking off his garments. He's putting on the the, uh, the cloth around his waist, and he is washing the feet of his disciples. And he is putting on full display yet again the incredible importance of what he's trying to get them to understand that they need to love by serving. This recalls back to uh, Matthew, what is recorded for us in Matthew chapter 20. Jesus called them to him 
and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them and their great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant and whoever would be first among you must be your slave, even as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. And here in John, at the, in that upper room, we find that Jesus is putting this again on full display. He's not just, he, it's not just lip service. He's not just speaking it. He is, he is not only speaking it, but he is living it. And he is giving a ready example for all who would follow him, but specifically for the disciples there in that upper room. And Jesus not only spoke with humility, but he served with humility, and he was calling those who would come after him to live the same. We are to humbly serve one another. And this is what we find being stressed here in our passage. In verses 3 through 8 of Romans chapter 12, we find that Paul is, is, is using all of this language to say, hey, look, you need to, you need to think humbly about yourself. You need to have a sober judgment about who you are and the, the grace that's been bestowed upon you. You shouldn't, you shouldn't think more highly of yourself than, than you ought to, but you need to have sober judgment of yourself. And then recognize that all of God's people are, are a body. They are a body together that is functioning for the purposes of God. And, you know, no one purpose is greater than the other, but we are, we are called to, to love and to serve with one another. But here's the reality. We cannot love in the way that the Bible is calling us to love without first knowing God's love. We just can't do it in and of ourselves that we might have times where we, uh, you know, feel gracious, but without the love of God, we will never be able to display the, the love the way that the scriptures call us to love. Uh, it was in 1 John, we find it so aptly put, we love because he first loved us. That's 1 John 4, 19. And as children of God, we need to daily, daily live in this love of God. But here's the thing, we often have a, a, a warped sense of what God's love is, right? Because we, we tend to base it off of things like how much money is in our bank account or how great the circumstances are in our lives or, you know, whether or not I, I got a front row parking spot or, you know, whatever it might be. You know, all of these things, they, those, cir those circumstances, um, they, they are not based on God's love for us. God's love for us is so much deeper than any of those things. And yet we, we tend to get these ideas that when things are not going our way, that God is somehow you know, less loving towards us, that if he would just do such and such, or if he would just change this, that, or the other thing, or whatever. And yet what the Bible lays out for us is that God's love for us was put on full display with Jesus on the cross. When we flash back to Jesus being on the cross, that is where we see God's love in full display. Romans 5, 8 tells us truth exactly in that way. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So rather than, you know, Christ coming to change our circumstances, he came to change us, right? He came to deal with the heart and not just the circumstances of this world. Those are going to be, uh, you know, in, under his full control uh, in due time, in his time. But when Jesus came and was nailed to the cross, he was doing that not just to change circumstances, but to change hearts. And this is why we can, 
you know, attest what, what Paul says in Romans 8, 38 and 39, that, it, you know, nothing can separate us from the love of God, no matter what the circumstances are that we will be faced in life. It is the love of God on full display in the cross that shows what true love is all about. And, and you know, therefore, you know, given this great mercy, this tremendous love in Jesus, Paul builds on his argument and, and the, all of the things that we see in the life of Christ. And he says in verse nine that of our text that love needs to be genuine. The Greek word here, it's anipokritos. Uh, 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 sorry if I mispronounced that. Uh, uh, it means pertaining to being genuine and sincere and lacking, lacking in pretense or show. It, 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 it can be translated like without hypocrisy. It means not to be fake, not to be pretend. You know, there are some people that, that you come across in life and they, and they might have a, a smile on their face, you know, like their, their lips are turned up, but they're not smiling with their eyes, right? There's like, there's sometimes there's this, this, this show that people put on. They want to put on a happy face, but there's just something. You just know that there's something that is lacking, that something that is missing in their lives. And, and it's, it's that type of, of pretense, that 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 fake show that Paul wants us to be on guard against. The, uh, the, the English word sincere comes from the Latin sine sera, meaning without wax. And it comes from this, uh, this ancient practice where wax was often used to fill cracks of inferior uh, pottery so that it could be sold at a higher price because it, it will it will look like it, it it's actually worth more than it actually is but it would be the genuine uh, you know the genuine ware that would that would have stamped on the bottom of it sine uh, sera meaning without wax meaning that it it was the real deal. It, it was not doctored in any way. And so it had that stamp of approval. And so when it comes to people and when it comes to our relationships, it means that, that the sincere person is the one who is not hiding their true nature. They're not being hypocritical in their words or their actions. And this is, this is the level that God is calling his people to live at, right? That we would love one another with this same genuine love that Jesus had and that and that his love would be reflected in our lives in the way that he loves us. So then Paul continues um, in, in this passage by saying that we need to hate what is evil and cling to what is good. Man, there's a, the, there's a lot that could be said here. But as I thought about this, I think that there's a real caution that needs to be leveled here is that, you know, it's, and I, I have this tendency in my life, right? Because I, I want to be holy. I want to be true. I want to be noble towards the things that are God, you know, honoring to the Lord. And yet sometimes I forget that I was a sinner, right? And so I start to treat people in a way that that betrays that that prideful attitude of like well why don't you think in this way why don't you you know behave in this way and the scriptures this passage is is challenging that that type of an attitude that we wouldn't live with hypocrisy that we wouldn't pretend as if we didn't ever struggle or that we don't even now continue to struggle with the sin nature you know we are all day by day by God's grace, we are being sanctified and we are being molded and shaped into the image of God so that we would honor Christ with our lives. But, you know, this, this verse, Romans 12, 9, telling us to hate what is evil and to cling, what is good, cling to what is good, we need to be careful of that, that haughty attitude, that, that prideful, uh, you know, way of, of, of talking to or maybe even about people that would make it sound like we don't still struggle with those things. 
We are called to show love to people, Paul is saying. But let's not get overly sentimental on this point, right? I love what James Montgomery Boyce says here in his commentary. He says, um, you know, love is not some mushy emotion that embraces all, forgives all, and forgets all, and requires nothing, right? Real love acknowledges the truth of the situation and then will call people out of it. Not manipulating, but just gently, lovingly calling them out of that old way of life. Douglas Moo says, what Paul is suggesting is not a directionless emotion or something that can, can be only felt and not expressed. Love is not genuine when it leads to a person doing something evil or avoiding doing what is right as being defined in God's word, right? And so we, we have a direction. We have Jesus as, as our focal point. He is the one that we are looking to, and, and he is our greatest example. And we have his word that has been given to us that, that it, 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 it pierces into our hearts and reveals those, those attitudes and, and things that are in our lives that are, that are sinful that, that we need to, uh, you know, agree with Scripture that it is evil and that it is not good, and we, sh- we, should only, we should seek to cling to those things that are good and holy and true and right. And, uh, and we need to, to encourage each other in the body to do the same. And Paul, he builds on this theme of loving others by, uh, by stating in, in Romans 12, 10, that we need to love others one another with brotherly affection. The NIV says we need to be devoted to one another in brotherly love. You know, this this type of love is not just the the casual at a distance, hey, how you doing? You know, oh man, isn't the weather great? Or man, you know, how about those Seahawks or the Mariners or, you know, whatever, you know, um, you know, maybe just the casual, uh, you know, exchanges that will take place. Uh, you know, on a Sunday morning or whatever. But Paul is admonishing Christians to be devoted to one another out of family love, like this brotherly love. And and the whole idea of this is that there's there's this, this idea, this sense of a family connection, right? That you wouldn't just easily give up on, on one another, but that you would be devoted to one another. You know, we are a part of God's extended family and we need to display the fierce loyal love that was displayed by Jesus in how we interact with one another and Paul calls all believers in this passage to display this high level of of honor and and respect for one another and in verse 10 it says honor one another above yourselves Uh, The ESV says, outdo one another in showing honor. To show honor to one another means not only to respect each other, but to place a high value on each other. But here's the problem. All too often, I'm just focused on myself. Right? Can you identify with that? I, I mean, I think all too often we are just way too consumed with self. And so... We need to, the scriptures are constantly calling us to to be living in this daily reflection of the life of Jesus and his sacrifice and then praying that his Holy Spirit would empower us to live in that same selfless way. Instead of constantly looking for other people to to recognize us and to to praise us and celebrate us for all the great things that we're doing, we need to be looking instead at at others and seeing, well, how how can I encourage you? How can I bless you? You know, and uh, and honor them. You know, we see this this idea reflected in Paul's other writings uh, when he wrote to the church in Philippi. In Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 through 11, hear these words. He says, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of you look not only to his own interests, 
but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You know, in today's culture, it's so easy to just be caught up in self, to always be looking at, you know, the dirt in other people's lives and to, to use that as an excuse for whatever, you know, I'm going to live, at least I'm not as bad as them or whatever. But we need to honor other people. We need to see in others their value, their worth their identity as being image bearers of God. And we need to point each other to Jesus and call out the better, you know, the, the gold, those nuggets that are in each and every person. Each and every one of us has been given an opportunity to give our lives back to God. And he wants to use your life in a way that will have tremendous impact in your world for the glory and honor of Jesus Christ. And so in closing, you know, just, just remember and reflect that by knowing and believing that God loves us and by reflecting on the life and the sacrifice of Jesus, we can then display the genuine love and honor that, that God shows to all of us as, as he loves us. He has laid down his life for you and me, and he now empowers us by his Holy Spirit. As we place our faith in him, we are empowered now to go into the world and to, to share this great love of God. And this, this passage is just, it, Paul just gets right to the heart of it. Christian, let's you and I this week, let's focus on the love of God and allow his love to flow through us into our world that we would see many lives be transformed by his love and his grace and his power. Amen. Let's close in prayer. Father God, we thank you so much for this time that we've had to look into your word and to be challenged by your, your holy scriptures. And we just pray that, that your power uh, that the power of your, your Holy Spirit would have free reign in our hearts and our lives, that you would be honored and glorified in all things, that we would not uh, be prideful, but that you would empty us of our pride and that our only boasting would be in the cross of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that the power of God may be on full display in this world to the honor and glory of Jesus who died for us. We pray in his name. Amen. Well, God bless you. Have a great week.